I'm 25 and it's Mother's Day. I'm sitting across from my mom at a restaurant. She's in a good mood, but at times it almost seems like she's about to nod off, a telltale sign that she's high. She's been on a hell of a bender for the past year ever since my grandmother died from cancer. I ask her again why she won't let me send her to rehab. She looks me dead in the eyes and says, because I love heroin more than anything else in the world, including you. I'm three years old, <clears throat> and I'm being screamed at by an adult woman, my mom, I think, for knocking over a basket of toys, even though the house we're staying at is filthy. I'm afraid she's going to hit me soon after I'm sent to live with my grandmother. I'm seven years old, and my mom was released from her most recent stint in jail. She's moved into the two-bedroom condo where I live with my grandmother and my two cousins. My mom says she's clean for good this time. Everyone keeps telling me that I should feel happy and lucky to have my mom back. But I really don't know how to feel excited about someone that I don't actually know. Roughly a year later, my mom tells me that she and I will be moving into our own place together, a condo in the same complex where my grandmother lives. I guess I don't look excited enough because she yells at me that I should be thankful that I'm getting my own room. I tried to feign excitement, but I'm scared. Even though she's been back for a year and she has stayed sober, I don't trust her. I want to stay with my grandmother. I tell my grandmother that I don't feel safe with my mom, but she just laughs and tells me that I shouldn't worry, that she's my mom and she loves me. I spend the rest of the day terrified that my grandmother will tell my mom that I don't want to live with her. Thankfully, she doesn't. I'm 16 years old, and I just got a first, my first B in a class. Despite the fact that I've always been good at math, I just can't seem to wrap my brain around calculus. I'm terrified to tell my mom because I know I'm going to be punished severely for it. <laughs> probably another week at least of being confined in my room for every waking moment not spent at school or at church with only my bed and my books to keep me company. I'm used to being yelled at for A minuses, but a B may as well be an F to my mom who has seemingly replaced her addiction to heroin with the addiction to being the perfect mother raising the perfect daughter. The stress of trying to live up to her standards is taking its toll on me physically. I haven't been able to sleep without sleeping pills since the beginning of my sophomore year, and I'm becoming a regular at the local urgent care due to stress-related headaches, heart palpitations, and on one occasion, fainting in class during a particularly difficult test. Rather than showing concern, my mom takes every opportunity to criticize me for being so weak. I'm 21 years old, and I'm at a family gathering at my friend Lauren's house. Her family has become my surrogate family, and I spend many holidays with them instead of my own. I'm incredibly close with her mom, Leslie, who often reminds me that there's the family that you're born with and the family that you choose, and I chose you. Lauren's house has become something of a safe space for me over the years, but I'm not feeling very safe at the moment. Her dad is telling me that he saw my mom panhandling at a grocery store the other day. He wonders out loud how this happened, even though he already knows that around the time I turned 18, she started drinking excessively, abusing prescription opiates, and eventually resorted to buying heroin from whoever was selling it in the neighborhood. He phrases it as a question, but it feels like an accusation as if I'm not already trying everything I can think of to get her the help that she so clearly needs. My cheeks are starting to turn red from shame and anger, so I excuse myself to the bathroom to pull myself together. I'm 28, and I'm sitting on the floor of the townhouse my boyfriend and I are renting in Silicon Valley. I've built a solid career for myself in real estate, but the market crash of 2008 and the subsequent recession has left me feeling stuck and without many options. My boyfriend decided to take a job offer in Mountain View, and I'm excited for a fresh start, even though it meant moving away from San Diego and the friends that I've known for most of my life. 
While unpacking, I come across a box of old photo albums and mementos from my childhood that I actually had to steal from my mother before I moved. She's lost everything over the years, and this box contains the only evidence left that I even had a childhood. While looking through it, I come across a folder of documents that I've never seen before. They're depositions and transcripts from the hearing when my grandmother was granted custody of me when I was three. As I'm reading the sworn deposition of a doctor who examined me, I reach a section where he stated, the child appeared to have burn marks on her arms, legs, and torso, as though someone had burned her repeatedly with a cigarette. He later noted that there were signs of sexual assault. I'm horrified that anyone would do such monstrous things to a child. And then I realize that I'm that child. I barely make it to the bathroom before I start throwing up. The next morning, I call my mom, who is now living with my Aunt Karen. My mom denies everything, and my aunt backs her up, contradicting her own sworn deposition on the matter. I hang up feeling more alone than I've ever felt in my life, convinced now more than ever that no matter how horrifically my mom behaves, my family will always forgive her, even at my expense. I'm hit with the realization that at eight years old, they gave me back to a woman they fought vehemently for custody only five years earlier. They gave me back to this woman who abused me and let other people abuse me too. I spend the rest of the day in bed crying because I don't know how to process what I've learned. I don't know how to be a part of my family anymore. A few months later, my mom calls me to tell me that my beloved dog, Jewel, has died and that she hopes that hurts because I abandoned both her and the dog when I left. She says that she hates me and wishes that I was never born. Through tears, I tell her that I never want to speak to her again. And I don't. I'm 31 and I'm back in San Diego. <clears throat> I just moved into my very own place. A studio in North Park that's roughly the size of a postage stamp, but is absolutely perfect for me. It's the day after Thanksgiving, and I'm reflecting on the past few weeks and how thankful I am. When my relationship ended and I decided to move back home, I had almost nothing. No savings, no safety net, just my dog buddy, a bed, some clothes, and some books. I had no idea how I would manage to get back to San Diego, let alone survive once I got there. But my friend Jessica stepped up and got me a job with her dad's company. And my friend Susie offered to let me and Buddy stay in her spare room until we found a place of our own. My friend Daniel, who I met when I was living in Mountain View, offered to drive me and all my belongings down in a U-Haul because I was frankly terrified of driving a big ass truck for nine hours all by myself. And my friend Jamie gave me her old car so I wouldn't have to walk two miles to the bus stop every morning to get to work. Sitting on my bed in my studio with my dog, eating the leftovers from the incredible Friendsgiving feast that my friend Paige had the day before, I suddenly start ugly crying tears of joy because for the first time in my life, I know what it feels like to have a family. To have people who want to be there for me no matter what, who don't see our relationship as transactional, but who love me just the way I am. People who stepped up for me in a way that my own family never has. It feels like home. I'm 33 and I'm sitting alone in the house that I own with my fiance. He's away in Las Vegas with his best friend for his bachelor party. My phone rings and it's an unknown number. I typically don't answer unknown calls, so I let it go to voicemail, but they don't leave a message. Out of curiosity, I Google the number, only to find out that it's the San Diego County morgue. I know what this means. I call back, and the man who answers awkwardly informs me that my mother is dead. He wants to know if I want to claim her body. I told him I don't but that her sisters might. 
He tells me he'll email me the necessary forms and ends the call. I take a few deep breaths, then start making phone calls to the various family members to give them the news. My knack for compartmentalization kicks in and I'm all business on these calls despite the, fact, or despite the histrionics on the other end of the line. I feel guilty for feeling so numb, but a lifetime of being the responsible one makes me feel like breaking down isn't an option. My Aunt Karen says she'll claim the body. Later I found out that she held a funeral for my mom, but I wasn't invited. My stoic facade is starting to crack by the time I call my fiancé and my friends to tell them the news. They offer to rush over to be with me, but I tell them that I'm not feeling up for company just yet. I can feel the walls of my mental compartments breaking down, and I know I'm about to break. My mother spent years telling me that showing emotions was a sign of weakness, and I'm still very uncomfortable with the idea of grieving in front of other people. I need time to process my feelings. It was a call that I had been expecting for years, and somehow I feel completely unprepared for it. My emotional defenses are so thoroughly destroyed by the realization that the tiny ember of hope that she might one day be the mother that I so desperately yearned for, an ember that I didn't even realize was still burning, had been snuffed out by the finality of her death. I don't know how to process the waves of loss, sadness, anger, guilt, and relief that are flooding my heart. By the following afternoon, I'm ready to be surrounded by the people who love me. My five closest friends, Jessica, Jamie, Paige, Natalie, and Nicole, show up with enough food to feed a small army. We talk about our lives and we share stories about the past. I've known most of these women since middle school and high school, and as such, they bore witness to my mom's transition from overbearing helicopter mom to depraved junkie. They even managed to make me laugh a few times, despite the fact that I've spent a good portion of the afternoon trying, often unsuccessfully, not to cry. In the days that followed, my friends would check up on me frequently to make sure that I was doing okay. I didn't hear much from my blood relatives, but my friends and my fiance showed me more love and kindness than I've ever felt entitled to. I'm 36 and I'm holding my newborn son, Betty, in my arms. I'm crying again, which has been happening a lot since his birth a few weeks ago. <laughs> but I'm not crying out of sadness or pain. I'm crying because I can't believe it's possible to love someone this much. The lack of sleep, the middle of the night feedings, the ear-shattering crying fits, the sudden and incredibly frequent encounters with every gross bodily fluid imaginable, <laughs> honestly don't bother me as much as I feared that they would, because I know in my heart that there's nothing I won't do for my son. The way he settles down when I sing to him and hold him close melts away all my fears that I could never be a good mother. I shudder when I think of what my life was like when I was his age. And I cry again for the baby I once was and for the love that I never felt. But I have love now, so much that I sometimes think my heart might burst. Once again, my best friends have rallied to show me just how much they care. They stop by with dinner and to play with Benny and to remind me that I'm doing just fine even when I'm feeling overwhelmed. I'm 41 now, and as ever, I often think about Leslie's words. There's the family that you're born with and the family that you choose, and I choose you. She passed away in 2009, and I could write another whole story about how much she meant to me. And maybe I will someday. But for now, I'm just so fucking grateful to all the people who chose me. Put your hands together for Vamp first timer, Michaela Posner.